Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 10. First, we're going to read verse 1, and then we're going to skip down to verse 17. The Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. Now, move on down to verse 17. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I want to read that last verse again. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I was born into a family that didn't go to church. Until I was five years old, my family was basically like any other family. We weren't particularly religious, but we weren't particularly evil either. If I had to describe my family before I've come to the Lord, it would just be like we're just a normal, lower middle class American family trying to improve their lot in this world. And my parents weren't particularly good. They weren't particularly bad. They just were who they were. When I was about five years old, I didn't know this story until after my, uh, one of my, I think my mother passed away, and I may have shared this with you before, so I won't belabor it. But my next door neighbor came over and across the fence and talked to my dad and asked if he could take me to Sunday school. This is when I was five years old. And my dad said, yeah, I should take him myself, but you go ahead and do that. That was a point of change for my life, but it was also a point of change for my entire family's life. It just so happened that my neighbor went to the local Assembly of God church, and I went to Sunday school and an Assembly of God Sunday school, and I got old enough to hear the preaching and understand the Word of God. I went upstairs, and I'd listen to the preacher talk. Now, I couldn't understand half the words he was saying. I wasn't much bigger than Caleb over here. I didn't have an extensive vocabulary. But what I had been taught in Sunday school and what I'd been taught in children's church about Jesus made me want to know him better, made me want to know him more. And I thought, you know, Sunday school is all right. Children's church is all right. Flannel graph, maybe some people don't even know what flannel graph is anymore. <laughs> flannel graph is all right, but all the real stuff is taking place upstairs. So I want to get up there and find out what's going on and learn more about Jesus and learn more about all this stuff. So they, can, they agreed, as long as I'd behave myself, they'd let me come upstairs during the worship service. And one of the strangest things that happened was at that time, I had never heard anybody speak in tongues. I'd never heard any of the gifts of the Spirit. And so when that first happened in the church upstairs, now it didn't happen down in Sunday school. It didn't happen down in children's church. But once I got upstairs in the adult meeting, there was speaking in tongues. There was interpretation. There was prophecy. And so I didn't know what it was. I was just a little kid. So I started asking my neighbor, I said, what is that? And they began telling me about how the Holy Spirit would come on people. And the Holy Spirit would give them an utterance. The Holy Spirit would speak through them, either in tongues or interpretation of tongues or in prophecy. And I tell you what, I was all with that. That was exciting. Oh, you mean that being in church and being a Christian isn't just about sitting back and listening to somebody tell me stories about things that happened a long time ago? that God actually is here right now, that God actually still moves by His Spirit right now today, just like He did back in the days of those Bible stories that they taught me about in Sunday school and children's church. And they said, yes. And that's the day that I found out I was Pentecostal. <laughs> Hallelujah. I wasn't serving a God who was a distant memory. I wasn't serving a God who was just an abstract theory. I was serving a God who manifested himself in the midst of his people. And he spoke to his people right here, right now, today, just like he did 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Now that was exciting. 
And as I grew older, I learned more about the gifts of the Spirit and the manifestations of the Spirit. There's nine manifestations of the Spirit. They're not the manifestations of the person. They're the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And I learned about those things, and I was excited about those things. But then I ran across this scripture we just read in Luke chapter 10. Those people had an exciting experience with God as well. Those people had an exciting experience with Jesus as well. Jesus, before he went to the cross, before he died for our sins, before he rose from the dead, he gave a little bit of his power on a specific mission at a specific time to a specific group of 72 people. And he sent them out two by two into every town and village where he was planning to go. Now, what does that tell me? It tells me two things. It tells me that Jesus was planning to go to at least 36 places. How do you know that? 72 divided by 2 is 36. So he was planning on going to 36 different places, and he sent these people out two by two. The second thing it taught me was that any time we manifest the power of God, it is him manifesting himself through us, and it is not us doing it under our own power or under our own authority. And that's something I think we've forgotten a little bit in the church today. We think that Jesus has just handed everything over to us for us to do with as we please, for us to manage as we might, but he hasn't. The manifestations of the Holy Spirit are still under the authority and still under the control of the Holy Spirit. I got so excited when we went to Oral Roberts University and I learned about the gifts of the Spirit. I got to sit in the final class called the Holy Spirit in the Now that Oral Roberts personally taught in the Maybe Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I treasure that experience. I also got to hear the previous semesters on videotape and on audio as a student at ORU, and especially semester two, where they got into the manifestations of the Spirit and how God wanted to move through his people, how God wanted to manifest his power and use his people to do so in the earth today. That was exciting to learn. But somewhere along the way, I lost sight of a very important verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11. And it says that he distributes them to each one according to his will. In other words, I can desire the gift of healing. I can desire the working of miracles. I can desire the word of knowledge. I can desire to be used by God in all of those things. But he's the one who decides whether or not I manifest that ministry in a certain place in a certain time. It isn't something that I can just generate and drum up in myself through wishful thinking or just repeating it over and over in my mind. I have to have his unction. I have to have his anointing. I have to have his presence. I have to have his power manifesting through me. Now, that was just an introduction to my introduction. How glorious that is, as glorious as it is, it is not any greater than what those 72 disciples experienced while Jesus was walking on the earth and they went two by two into every city and town where he was planning to go and they come back we read it after that the 72 came back rejoicing saying Lord even the demons are subject to us in your name oh they were excited they never experienced anything like that before they had lived ordinary lives in an ordinary world with ordinary struggles and ordinary conflict and they hadn't experienced the supernatural power of God until Jesus sent them out on that mission. And when Jesus sent them out on that mission, they healed the sick. They performed miracles. They did the works of God. And as they did those works and they performed those miracles, they even cast demons out of people. People were controlled by other spirits other than the spirit of God. And it was so bad, they didn't even have control over their own spirit because their own spirit was overrode by the demon spirit. You see, that's why it's so important what we open ourselves up to in this world. Because there are other spirits in this world besides our human spirit. There are other spirits in this world besides the Holy Spirit. There are demon spirits that are still here today just as they were in the days when Jesus walked the earth. Peter said that your adversary, the devil, 
is roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. Well, who may he devour? The one who opens themselves up to the spiritual influence of demonic activity. That's whom he'll devour. And they come back rejoicing, saying, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus acknowledged the power. He acknowledged that what they had done had been done through God. He said, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven, and I've given you authority to trample scorpions. And he was talking in terms of, of spiritual forces. A scorpion has a very painful sting. It can attack you. It can, it can have a painful sting. And serpents can bite you, and they can fill you with its venom. And, and those were words he was using. They were metaphors that he was using to describe the spiritual forces of evil that can come against a person and enslave them. And he says, I've given you all that authority. Nevertheless, nevertheless, do not rejoice that you have power over spirits, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, if that applied to them 2,000 years ago, it certainly applies to us right now here today. And there are some people who want to preach and want to manifest these supernatural manifestations of the Holy Spirit, and that's where they want their focus to be. That's what they're all excited about. Well, if I can just go out there and perform these miracles, if I can just go out there and heal the sick, if I can just go out there and make prophecies over people, if I can just go out there and give words of knowledge, why, I'll be somebody. Of course, all the glory goes to God, but I'll still be somebody. And Jesus said... Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. He redirected their rejoicing. He redirected their rejoicing because he knew what was coming. You see, Jesus doesn't have a problem with demons. He has authority over all of them. In fact, every time he ran into one, they said, Lord, please don't torment us. Lord, please don't send us to the pit before the appointed time. It's you and I who have problems with demons. It's you and I who have problems with religious spirits and have problems with other kinds of spirits. It's you and I that have those problems. And Jesus told them, don't rejoice over your power over spirits. I've got that handled. I've already got authority over all the spirits. <laughs> I created all the spirits. What you need to concern yourself with, rather than having power over spirits, you need to concern yourself with making sure that your name is in my book. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So that got me to thinking about this book this book of life. And so I began to do a scripture study on it, and I discovered some very interesting things. Why is it so important to have your name written in the book of life? Well, the reason it's so important is because only those whose names are written in the book of life will escape the second death. That is more important than anything else in the world, that you and I have our names written in the Lamb's book of life, so that when the final judgment does come, when it finally gets here, we will be safe in Jesus. Hallelujah. Washed in the blood of the Lamb, sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit, and qualified to inherit the kingdom of God. That is more important than the car you drive, the house you live in, the money you make. That's more important than the deeds you do. That's more important than anything you can imagine. Anything you can name that you could accomplish or you could desire on this life and in this world. Listen to me at Malachi chapter 4 real quick in verse 1. You see, the reason Jesus told them to rejoice that their names were written in heaven was because he knew what was coming. And I'm going to tell you this morning what is coming and why it is so important for you and I to have our names written in that book. This is what's coming. Listen to me. This is what's coming. It's not a maybe. It's not a could be. It's not a might happen. This is the word of the living God. This is what is going to take place. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Though that's the last book of the Old Testament. 
the book of Malachi, before we have Jesus come 400 years later and bring in the message of the kingdom and the, the, the new covenant in Jesus Christ. It says, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor Branch, Friends, that day is coming as sure as I'm standing here in front of you in this pulpit. I don't know when it is. I don't know how far away it is. I know that at least one thing, that when Jesus comes back, that's when the day is coming. <laughs> but I don't know how far away it is. And neither do you. And that's why it's important that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. The Apostle Peter, who is probably one of the ones standing there when Jesus said those words, do not rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It's a very good possibility since the 12 apostles followed Jesus everywhere he went. They would have been there when the 72 came back that they heard the same words that Jesus said to them. Look what Peter says. Second Peter chapter three. He says, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets. Now, that's what we just read in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1. Malachi 4 and 1, that day is coming. That you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So those were two different sources, two separate sources. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. Following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens and the earth existed long ago by God's command. And the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Now listen to verse 7. But by the same word. What word? By the same word that God created the heavens and the earth. By the same word that God spoke when he told Noah, I'm going to bring a flood on the earth and destroy all life. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Well, what is he talking about there? He's talking about what we just read in Malachi chapter 4, that the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the evildoers, all the arrogant, all of the scoffers, all the unbelievers will be like stubble, and that day will burn them up. That's what he's talking about here in Second Peter. He says that the the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So this is why Jesus told them, don't rejoice that spirits are subject to you. Rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven because there's something coming on the road, down the road here that you need to be prepared for. And the only way you're going to get through it, and the only way you're going to survive is if you got your name in my book. Go back to the book of Daniel. Now we're going back to the Old Testament. Now, Peter told them, reminded them of the predictions of the prophets. Here's one of them. The first one we read was in Malachi. Here's the second one. This is talking about what's going to happen when Jesus actually does return to earth. It says, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. Talking about the people of Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble such as has never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Now listen to this. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. You know, what really amazed me is I looked these scriptures up this weekend and, and traced this through is that this book of life, this book that God has written that contains the names of those who are going to escape the second death, this book goes all the way back to the Old Testament, all the way back to the time when God delivered Israel out of Egypt, and it goes all the way up until now. This book is all the way through Scripture. Now, there's not a lot, a ton of Scriptures about it, but it's there. 
And this is one of the places that we find it. There's another place too back in Malachi, but we're not to that yet. He says that many of your people, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Jesus redirected their rejoicing from having divine supernatural power to overcome demon spirits, to rejoicing that their names were written in God's book. And friends, this morning, that's where our rejoicing needs to be as well. Our rejoicing needs to be in the fact not that we have a large congregation, not that we have a large building, not that we're well known around the country or well known around the world, not that we have a radio or television or internet ministry, not that we have lots of money coming in and tithes and offerings, not any of those things. But our rejoicing is to be in this one thing, that our names are written in heaven. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation chapter 20. Let's start reading at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small. That means important people in the eyes of the world and unimportant people in the eyes of the world. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Now, there's two books open here. There's two sets of books open here. The first book, it says that books were open. That's all it says. It just says books were open. Then it says that the dead were judged by what was written in the books. But written in what books? The first set of books. Well, what was the first set of books? The first set of books was every thought, every word, every deed and every action of everyone. That's the first set of books. In other words, we can't hide from God. We can't do something and think, hey, God's not paying attention right now. I just think I'll go over here and do this little thing. No, 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 no. Everything is written down. Now, I don't know what kind of recording system or storage system God uses. I know that in our human life, we've gone through having papyrus with little quills to where now we have the cloud and we can store everything in the cloud. But we've gone from that to that. And that's just in our human abilities. That's just in this natural world, in our natural ability to record things. God has his own set of books. And I don't know how he records it. I don't know that technology. But I know that on that day when that great white throne is set in place and someone sits on that throne who has authority to judge everybody, that books are going to be open. And the dead are going to be judged according to what is found in those books. But the good news here this morning, that's not the only set of books that's going to be open. <laughs> There's another book. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> There's another book that's going to be opened. The book of life belonging to the Lamb. And yes, the dead are going to be judged according to what was written in those books. But then after they get done reviewing those books, they're going to go over here and they're going to take a look at that book. And if your name is in that book... It don't matter a hill of beans what's in those other books. What matters is your name is in that book. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Filled with the Holy Ghost I am. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. Hallelujah to the Lamb this morning. Yes, that set of books is going to be there. That set of books is going to be open. The only good thing about that set of books and here's something very important. I know we're not saved by works. I know we're saved by grace through faith. Don't start writing into me and telling me, oh, you're trying to say we're saved by works. No, we're not saved by works. We work because we are saved. We don't work in order to get saved. But everything that's good that is in those books, you're going to be rewarded for. Why? 
Because of your works? No, because your name is over here in this book. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. But that day is coming. That day of judgment when the, de- when the dead, both small and great, stand before the throne and the books are open. Then another book is opened, which is the book of life. The question this morning is, is our name written in that second book? Turn with me one over to Revelation chapter 21. And here we're going to read verses 22 through 27. Now, this is after this judgment takes place. This is after these dead have been judged. This is after the rewards have been given. God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. The old heaven and the old earth are going to disappear. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And look to what God says about this new heaven and new earth. He says, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But look at verse 27. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those are the only people who are ever going to see that city. So the most important thing that can happen in our lives is to make sure our names are in that book.